most people come to me with one of two questions. They either want to know, Chloe, what should I be doing? Or they want to know, Chloe, is what I'm doing what I should be doing? So it's a way of trying to help people work out what they should be doing, especially when it comes to marketing and traffic driving, because it leads to retailers going, oh, I need to do more Facebook ads, or oh, I need to do some Twitter ads, or oh, I need to do some Google shopping campaigns. Whereas actually they're thinking solution first, and what they should be thinking is problem first in terms of we need more new traffic to our website and the model is kind of like a visual aid memoir to go, hold on a second, let's take a step back. Where is our gap at the moment? This podcast is brought to you by Bambassadors.com, the go-to platform for e-commerce brands to create video reviews that boost social proof and sales on TikTok and beyond. Get your first video review created and posted by a genuine creator, completely free no strings attached, and no credit card required at Bambassadors.com. Welcome to the Ecom X Factor podcast, where it's all about launching and scaling your business using sales funnels, automations, and smart marketing. And now, please welcome your host, the founder of Ecom X Factor, Yaron Bin. Hi, Chloe. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Great to be here. Great to have you here. I'm looking forward to uh, our conversation. Before hopping on this call, we already discussed a few topics. And um, you picked my curiosity with, uh, with, with your books and a lot of other topics. So I'm sure it's going to be very in- interesting. For the listeners who are just joining in, can you share a bit about your background and what you're doing these days? Yeah, sure. So I've been in the world of e-commerce and marketing for over 15 years now. I started off in marketing and banking, of all things, left that quite fast and ended up working for a UK high street retailer who had a website and a catalog set mailing program. Fell in love with conversions and data and then mm-hmm. got totally into the, into the online world from being a direct mail specialist. And then I worked as head of e-commerce for a group of mail order brands. And then that turned into a marketing agency, which I ran for 10 years, eventually specializing mainly in Google ads with a bit of Facebook ads too. Um, I sold that in 2017 and since 2012, so I was running two businesses for a while, I've been focused on um, what I do here at e-commerce master plan, which is all about helping e-commerce business owners and marketers make better decisions. And historically, I did that as a coach and consultant. And these days, I'm lucky enough to do that purely through speaking and writing. So I write books, I host a podcast, and I speak at many events and try and bring the insight, the guidance, the processes to people to help them make their businesses better. Sounds great. So can you elaborate about your books? Yeah, sure. So there's there's been um, there's been a whole host of them over the last ten years. It all started with e-commerce master plan, which was or still is um, out there, still very relevant, and is all about trying to kind of demystify some of the strategic choices you have to make in creating an e-commerce business. Then came e-commerce marketing, which I rewrote in 2019 and has been pretty much a bestseller on Amazon ever since, which blows my mind. Uh, it's full title, I should say, it's e-commerce marketing, how to get traffic that buys, because half the customers call it how to get traffic that buys, which is never what it is in my head, but the customer's always right. So I'm happy mm-hmm. with that. Um, and that one um, is all about how to approach the different e-commerce marketing methods. And it's kind of the sister book to another one I wrote called Customer Persuasion. And both of those feature my customer master plan model. Mm-hmm. which is kind of a way of thinking about e-commerce. It's kind of my key key model for, for making better decisions in e-commerce. And um, then uh, the other one, or the other two, there's B2B e-commerce master plan, which is about switching from a massive sales team selling products to other businesses to selling all of that via online. And then e-commerce Delivery, which is my Mm -hmm. tiny book, but on a very important topic, which I think I wrote now maybe eight years ago, but is still highly relevant, um, especially with all that's been going on on over the last couple of years. So yeah, they're they're all on different aspects of e-commerce and all still highly relevant. Awesome. Where should I take it from here? Maybe, maybe you can, can you elaborate about your, you said like you have a model 
uh, in which you, which you use in order to to implement and build a strategy. So can you elaborate about this model? Yeah, of course. Of course, I should have said um, all the books are available on Amazon. Of course, just go go to Amazon, you'll find them all. Yeah. So the the customer master plan model is something. I created because I find most people come to me with one of two questions. They either want to know, Chloe, what should I be doing? Or they want to know, Chloe, is what I'm doing what I should be doing? So it's a way of trying to help people work out what they should be doing, um, especially when it comes to marketing and traffic driving. But it's also something that I built to deal with an issue I have with how people often approach their marketing, which is the fault of all of us in this industry who are non-retailers for all the blogs and podcasts and webinars and everything that we do, shouting about new marketing methods, because it leads to retailers going, oh, I need to do more Facebook ads, or oh, I need to do some Twitter ads, or oh, I need to do some Google shopping campaigns. Whereas actually they're thinking solution first and what they should be thinking is problem first in terms Mm -hmm. of we need more new traffic to our website or we need to convert more first-time buyers to repeat buyers and the model is kind of like a visual aid memoir to go hold on a second let's take a step back where is our gap at the moment so what does the model look like which is the one Mm -hmm. thing i failed to tell you all if you imagine six circles along the bottom of the page these you can think of them kind of like as lily pads i call them the customer relationship levels and everyone in the world sits on one of these six lily pads or circles in relationship to your business so on the far left we have the world which is everyone in the world whether they've heard about your business or not next one in is visitors these are the ones we've managed to get to your website which is really important then we have The inquirers, who are people who've given you their email address or their SMS details, so good old first-party data. Then we have first-time buyers, and I should point out I'm perfectly happy for someone to come to your website and buy rather than become an inquirer first, because I often get asked that question. And then we have repeat buyers who bought more than once, and then we have regular buyers who bought more than twice. And all the work we do in an e-commerce business, in every single department of that business, is about moving people between these lily pads. So it breaks it down into five stages. So stage one is from the world to visitors. Stage two is from visitors to inquirers. Stage three, from inquirers to first-time buyers. And you get the idea. So our marketing is, we we do marketing in stage one, marketing in stage two, marketing in stage three. We have different customer service methods in those different places, different automations, different things we need to put on our website, different things we need to do in terms of how we manage our delivery, in terms of how we manage what products we buy. Everything is about something that happens in one of these stages because our job when we're running an e-commerce business, we're working in an e-commerce business, is to get as many customers as possible from the left-hand side to the right-hand side as quickly as possible. It is that simple, but um, it's a long way from simple. But if you keep remembering that, keep looking back and going, where are we weakest? Where should we be focusing? And then think of all the different things you could do to improve in that space. That's how you then make your business better. And then there's a couple of other arrows that sit there. From bottom left to top right, we have the customer lifetime value or the money arrow, which is a reminder that as people move from the left to the right, they're worth more to you. And then from top left to bottom right, we have the people arrow, which is a reminder that you're talking to fewer people as you go across. Mm -hmm. So your marketing methods change, your channels change, the amount of investment time you put versus the impact changes as well. And then there's a really important arrow that sits across the whole thing with kind of like an arrow point on either end. So it's kind of like a, it's all encompassing. And I call it the conversation. If I was writing it now, the book now and creating the model now, rather than doing it a few years back, I would probably call it the story or not brand, because I think brand is misconstrued, but it's Mm -hmm. or values or something. But for me, the conversation is, I use that term because it needs to be consistent. And it's about that ongoing series of interactions you have with the customer. And the more powerful you make those in terms of the emotion you put into them, the honesty you put into them, the trust you build with all of that, the more consistent it is across the, uh, the whole piece the whole customer journey, the faster people move from left to right. It's like the grease that oils the wheels. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Wow. I, I love this this model. It makes a lot of sense. And it's uh, it sounds like very, it, it can really help to simplify 
your whole operation. But do you have any frameworks in order to analyze where should we focus our efforts? The rule of thumbs or guidelines, how to you know how to manage your effort with regards to which lily pad should you focus? Yes, of course. So, so the focus is never on the lily pad. The focus is on the step from one lily pad mm-hmm. to cool. the other. Mm-hmm. Because I think that's, that's actually interesting you ask that because a lot of um, people make the mistake thinking we need to focus on a first-time buyers. No, you need to focus on how to turn first-time buyers so. into repeat buyers. So it, it's about the, the space in between the lily pads. That's where we put our effort. Mm-hmm. Now, how you work out where you should focus, there are some really complicated maths you can do on this. Mm-hmm. And that's outlined in the books. But there's a much easier way to get started <laughs> because mm-hmm. usually there's a gap. So what I recommend as a starting point to implementing this in your business is take a white sheet of paper or Mm -hmm. open a Word doc or a Google doc if you prefer the online options and divide it into five boxes. And that's stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, stage five. So the world to your website, to visitors rather, visitors to inquirers, inquirers, first-time buyers, first-time buyers, to repeat buyers and repeat buyers, to regular buyers. And in each of those boxes, write down what you're currently doing to move people from one stage to the other. So in stage two, where we're turning visitors into inquirers, you might have email sign-up form in footer, SMS capture pop-up. Mm-hmm. Um, it might have email capture on entry to your checkout. There's not a lot you can do yeah. in terms of capturing email addresses in terms of the nuts and bolts. And then you, you, then you go on to, uh, you know, maybe the stage three where you're turning inquirers into first time buyers and you put abandoned basket campaign, you've put uh, remarketing on Facebook or on Google based on where people have got to in their visit through your website. And there may be a whole host of other things you're doing in that space too. And you fill in these. And when you find somewhere where you're doing absolutely nothing, that's the first place to start because the sum, if you've got this whole piece working, then that makes a massive impact on your business. And I think um, one of the areas people frequently have empty is the, the post-purchase part. Mm-hmm. So after someone's bought from the first time, what do you do to turn them into a repeat buyer? Often all we have in there is email broadcasts and maybe they happen to get more advertising from us, but we haven't done anything specific. So that's a key part of the process that a lot of people miss. Mm -hmm. And what would you suggest doing in in this part, for example? I think with all the delivery delays and delivery issues we've had of late, the first thing which you need to do to turn a first-time buyer to a repeat buyer is to get to grips with making the experience of actually getting their hands on your product for the first time as good as possible. Because if that experience is is not good, you are not setting yourself up to get another purchase. (laughs) So we've seen seen a lot of development in this space. I mean, it's something I think I've probably been talking about for 15 years. Um, In the last 10 years, it's become an awful lot easier to do. In the last two years, we've finally seen brands having the time and the reason to do it because of of all the issues we've had with delivery. Um, So the first thing to do is to create a sequence Mm -hmm. of communications that happens after someone places the order between then and when they receive it that sets the scene. So it both kind of pre-warns them about any delivery issues, which your customer service teams will massively thank you for. Um, But it also enables you to get them excited about the product before it even exists. So maybe you send them, here's how to use your product when it exists, or here's how other people have styled the product before it exists. So the kind of the ownership journey begins before they've actually got Mm -hmm. their hands on it. So email automation is your friend or SMS or whatever, you know, other channels you may be using. That's part one. Part two is they're making sure that when the product arrives, it, it's brilliant. So both it arrives correctly. So making sure you've got in-flight notifications going on, you've given people the right delivery options in the first place. And then that when that parcel arrives, it's a joy to receive. So there's mm-hmm. kind of, in my book, e-commerce delivery, I talk about this a lot and divide it into hygiene factors So the stuff we just expect, which is it arrives on time, unbroken, all those really basic stuff. And then the wow factors. Wow factors are things like brilliant packaging, totally recyclable packaging, packaging that can be reused as something else. Uh, Maybe there's a free gift 
in the box that they weren't even expecting, or there's an offer off their next um, their next order, or there's just something really nice mm -hmm. in that box. So you kind of got you've got to get the hygiene factors right, and then you have that wow that needs to come in as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do, do you have any examples of maybe something that wouldn't cost a, a lot that I can put in the packages in order to create this wow factor? Anything that comes to mind? One of the the coolest examples. I've seen recently, and this is one. So actually, before I give you the examples, I'll tell you what you need to, to do to, to find something, a good free gift to put in there. And this is whether you're using this free gift to incentivize purchase, you know, spend over 50 quid to get a free gift, mm -hmm. or, or whether you're using this as a surprise at the end of the process. So the free gift needs to be light and small. So as it's not affecting your postage um, costs mm -hmm. of getting the parcel out there. If you're selling I don't know, paperback books, you don't want to want your free gift to be a massive lamp. For sure. Because that would just be <laughs> stupid. I give an extreme example, but but think of something small and light that fits in the parcel. Think of something which costs you next to nothing, but has a much higher perceived value than it costs. Mm -hmm. So things like um bookmarks or or you know, small sachets of you know tea and that sort of thing. Mm. Nice. They don't actually cost you a lot when you buy them in bulk, but they have a much higher perceived value than they actually, um, you know, have when they go through. So you want something that's going to cost you pence, pennies, mm -hmm. yeah. um, but looks like it's worth maybe four, five, six pounds, dollars, euros, etc. Because then it, 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 you know, feels good and it doesn't cost you a lot either. Um, and then the other thing which it, which it really helps is if it fits with your branding. Mm -hmm. So does it fit with your values and your mission? Which I come back to this brilliant example, which this person does use as a way of incentivizing orders. So people know they're going to get it, but it's just so spot on. So there's a company in the UK called Neves Bees who make products mm -hmm. um, from beeswax. Okay. So lip balms and that sort of thing. There's a small business who want to stay small because they're using a specific set of beehives, et cetera, et cetera, and they enjoy the business as it is. Mm -hmm. And one of their, you know, big core values is about helping the bee population, which means, you know, we all need to plant more flowers and so on and so forth. So the gift they give is a packet of wild flower seeds. Mm. Nice. Totally, 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 totally on mission, on values. And if it's a, a, appealing to the end customer, that's the right sort of customer. The customer's going, what on earth am I going to do mm -hmm. with these? I don't see the point. They're the wrong customer for them in the first place. So, but if there's someone who, who gets it, gets the mission, loves the products, they're going to love the fact it's a packet of wild bird seeds. Now, they don't go down to the local garden center and buy packets of wild bird seeds. Mm -hmm. They go to the creators of wild bird seeds, you know, the people who, who put it in seed packets, and they buy a kilo mm -hmm. of wild bird seeds. Yeah. And then they've made up packets in their own branding with mm -hmm. their own instructions on for the wild bird seeds. And they put a few grams of wild bird seeds in each of these packets. So it costs them an absolute pittance. It's highly on brand, highly on message, highly you know, reflecting their values. It's going to bind the right customers to them more closely. It's a brilliant example. Another example I'll give you, which is um, slightly more fun, I suppose, mm -hmm. depending on how fun you find wild, wild flowers, <laughs> is the business Jersey Beauty, okay. who are based out of the Channel Islands in the UK. They sell brand name um, beauty gear. They were on a mission to try and find a product that they could use to stuff the parcels that wasn't plastic. Mm -hmm. And they started using popcorn, oh. um, not <laughs> sweet or salty popcorn, plain popcorn, which is a brilliant material for holding, you know, mm -hmm. uh, moisturizers and such in place in the parcels so as it doesn't get damaged in the post. And it got some amazing reactions from their customers of this popcorn and lots of, lots of social sharing going on with it so that's not nice. a free gift because they had to put in a note saying please don't eat the popcorn this is not food grade popcorn mm -hmm. but it had a marvelous impact and people people knew that wasn't a bad waste product the second they saw it they could chuck it in the compost put it in the bin it was okay it wasn't like it was um it was some plastic so that was another another really interesting example quick favor guys 
if you enjoy these shows and have been a listener for quite some time now, we would really, really appreciate it if you could take the time to give us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your preferred podcast app may be. Having lots of ratings and audience feedback makes our show become more visible across multiple platforms. And it also supports our mission of helping as many people as possible to become better marketers and better entrepreneurs. So if you're not driving and it wouldn't be dangerous, pause this thing right now and give us an honest review over your podcast app and we will love you even more than we already do thank you for taking the time and i hope you enjoyed the show yes this, uh, this is a brilliant idea because even in the delivery you, you can leverage delivery for for marketing efforts so even if many people may overlook this but these are examples that you can actually provide better delivery and then you can get like the social sharing and create a buzz just based on small minor tweaks in your delivery which is a brilliant in my opinion so thank you for sharing uh, these two examples my pleasure and the thing is delivery done well becomes a marketing channel in its own right mm -hmm. and i think too often we think of it as just a, a pain point both for us and the customers mm -hmm. and it With a little bit of work, it doesn't have to be. Great. And you, you mentioned perception, and we all know that perception is very vital in, in marketing and in e-commerce and in life in general. And one of your books is, is about uh, customer persuasion and doing, it, doing this ethically. Uh, can you elaborate about this aspect of doing marketing in an ethical way? Yeah, sure. So, so customer persuasion is, is the first part book where I mentioned my customer master plan model and it's it takes it beyond marketing so I dive into each of the stages in a lot of detail in terms of um, the customer service tasks you can take to improve your jumping people between the lily pads um, mm -hmm. I go into into briefly into the marketing side of things we get very into marketing messages and examples of things to do on your website in terms of getting into things like social proof and FOMO and these elements, mm -hmm. because all of these kind, these are all done to the extreme. They could be yeah. seen as manipulation, but they're really about persuading the customer onto the next stage, making the customer feel more comfortable, making the customer feel trust in your business. So they're ready to jump onto the next stage. And we, you know, like I said, the book goes through it in a lot of different angles in terms of doing it ethically i think you have to just you know keep in mind your missions and your values and make sure that you are putting the right products in front of the right people at the right time rather than becoming too much like an infomercial i suppose <laughs> um because it's our job is to help people find the products they want and to help mm -hmm. them buy those products it's not to sell people ever endlessly greater piles of tat. Yes, I agree. And I think that these days, brands are becoming more ethical, even if they don't do this by choice, uh, but just uh, there are much many more constraints and customers are way more aware and it's harder to trick the review systems. So brands are, are shifting their perspective and their whole strategies are becoming a bit more long-term. Uh, do you agree with this uh, assumption? You see I more brands moving towards like longer term thinking or not, not yes, really? Yes, I, I think I think we're slowly moving mm -hmm. towards longer term thinking. Um, I think it's if you're building a business for the long term, which I think everybody should be, your customers will quite quickly let you know if they're not happy with the way you're selling. Mm -hmm. Because if you're deploying your marketing tactics badly in terms of should you or shouldn't you be doing that, um, you will soon end up with consumers who bought your product who realized they didn't want it mm -hmm. and you will find out about that because the on the internet nothing is secret um, it will come back to you through your customer service through social media and so forth so you have you're, you're going to learn about it i think we're slowly starting to think more long term i think there's some amazing examples out there but i think we still in the industry are a little bit too hungry for big numbers rather than the right numbers if that makes sense um too hungry for growth at any cost uh, which is not always the right way to build a long-term successful business what would be like the key metrics that you would consider uh, like the right numbers instead of just focusing on growth like customer LTV for example it's not that it's the same kpis but we also mm -hmm. need to be aware of 
um, kind of the, the longer term sustainability mm -hmm. carbon impact of what mm. we're selling. You know, so it's interestingly, uh, very recently, Ugg Boots have just announced a repair service. Oh, nice. So they're still selling Uggs, but you can have your Ugg Boots completely reconditioned, resold, etc. I think it's $80. Um, now in the US. Now, the company they've announced they're doing it with only, could only manage to do 100 boots a day, I think it is, or a week, but they'll quite quickly scale that up. Mm -hmm. So that is an example of, yes, we're still selling, yes, we're still growing, but we're also now encouraging our customers when they get a stain on their Ugg boot, they're not throwing it away. They, they, there's this option to get it reconditioned to pr prolong the lifetime of those goods. There's um. Uh, another footwear brand, interestingly, called Vivo Barefoot, who mm -hmm. are going down this, this, well, they're very far down this route already. And they didn't do Black Friday in 2021. Instead, they su suggested people go and buy their reconditioned shoes. So they have people who send back in mm -hmm. their old Vivo Barefoot shoes and then they're reconditioned. So they kind of have this reselling market. Even the Selfridges department store in London now has something called Reselfridges, which is a platform for selling secondhand products. So it's not as simple as saying we're going to cap our growth rate to X. It's mm -hmm. more a case of looking at what are we selling? How is what we're selling could be better? How could we structure our processes better to, you know, to, to have a better quality supply chain, to have to be encouraging customers to buy the right product at the right time rather than just more, 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 more. And there are so many different ways to tackle it. This is a very interesting trend that I, I wasn't really aware of, I must admit. Are there any other trends that you're noticing lately that I might have not noticed? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, don't don't feel, uh, feel uh, you know, upset you're not, you're not noticing the trend because it's something which is is slowly being being shouted at a, a lot mm -hmm. more and it's something which we've just uh, refocused the e-commerce my e-commerce master plan podcast on mm -hmm. to share more of these stories so as people can see all the different ways that exciting e-commerce businesses are balancing growth with doing better mm -hmm. for the planet and for humanity and there's there's just some amazing some amazing examples out there but you said other trends yeah. the other one i'm really excited about in 2022 and probably beyond is partnerships, which is a is a fluffy old term. Mm -hmm. But what I mean by that is it seems to me a lot of the exciting marketing methods, a lot of the ways we're going to overcome the death of the cookie and all those issues, which let's not get into them, but mm -hmm. how we and how we're going to build these better relationships with our customers and build better businesses with this huge amount more e-commerce competition that there now is online as a result of the pandemic, it's leading us to, to see partnership marketing in a much more opportunity. So if you can get your story right, you can find the right brands to partner with, then you are going to find some great ways of getting the right message in front of the right people, which is going to bring you new customers and buy partnerships to get down to brass tacks. I'm sure some of your listeners are screaming at their, whatever they're listening to us, go, what does she mean by partnership? I mean everything from partnering with other brands who target the same customer base as you to listing on key marketplaces that put you in front of your, your key target market to influencer marketing, mm -hmm. to turning your own customers into partners, be that via loyalty programs or referral programs or nano influencer programs, and even affiliate marketing as well. And then, then you know, the outreach side of SEO to some extent and PR. But thinking about all of those as how can we create a partnership that enables us to increase brand advocacy amongst both our customers and the other people that we work with in these partnerships to get our message out there. So we're pulling the right customers to our business who will stick with us for the long run. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And with, with regards to, to partnership with, or maybe let's call it a brand ambassadors. So are you seeing on your end, any brands that are able to recruit ambassadors without paying them as if it was like a, a marketing channel, just a marketing channel that you pay for, for the ambassadors to speak on your behalf? 
Yeah, there are some fascinating models going on. We've just, tail end of um, 2020, we did a whole month on influencer marketing and a whole month on loyalty Mm -hmm. marketing on my Keep Optimizing podcast. And it was fascinating seeing the different approaches. And I think, to be honest, it could have all been one very long month uh, because we talked many Mm -hmm. of the same things across all eight episodes. But there are, there is... There's kind of no, just like there's no right, wrong way to do Black Friday anymore. There's no mm-hmm. right, wrong way to approach your brand ambassador program. And we discussed everything from creating a program where you're simply uh, doing referrals, you know, so mm-hmm. send us your friends, your friend will get 10, 10 pounds off, you'll get 10 pounds off. So very only pay on results based mm-hmm. soft marketing through to loyalty points programs where there's you know you get more points the more for every instagram share you do and uh you know kind of insult incentivizing the activity side of it mm-hmm. through to uh l- campaigns where you take your best customers who already talk about you on instagram and you say to them right every quarter you've got 50 dollars to spend in this category mm-hmm. Nice. And just let them have kind of free product of their choice mm-hmm. um, through to uh, affiliate marketing where you're paying based on performance. So all those tra- lovely tracked links and commission on sales uh, through to big fat checks for the right influencers. <laughs> so it's it's the whole wide angle. But the interesting thing is wherever, whoever I was talking to, whatever level of incentive they were saying you might get up to you know level Mm -hmm. of cost level of budget for every single one of them it always starts with your own customer base Mm -hmm. so you know messaging them and saying you know we're looking for some people to promote our products we'd love to hear your stories of how you'd like to promote us are you interested get back to us Mm -hmm. you know and it might be you just have them round to your pop-up store or your warehouse to get a first look at the product and Mm -hmm. you just treat them to a lunch so Think of how you can structure it to create the outcome you want rather than thinking you've got to go and spend 10 grand on Mm -hmm. high brand names because probably that's not the right place to start. Yeah. And did did anybody share during this uh, whole uh, marathon of of podcasts about influencer marketing, like an idea that uh, blew your mind with originality, something that you didn't expect? Um, I think one of the things which really surprised me was I had uh, Rick, McGin- Rick, Rick McGuinness on even, who's an affiliate marketing specialist who's now moving into the world of influencer marketing. So traditionally, affiliates has been, you put links on your website to our site and we'll pay you a commission on the sales. Uh, whereas influencers is, let's create some great content and away we fly. Uh, and then we might, we'll pay you up front. And those two worlds are colliding. And he was saying that, because I'm fully aware that now influencers are getting, being put on affiliate deals and that that's happening. What I hadn't realized was that a lot of affiliates are now wanting money up front Mm -hmm. to put in place your links on their website. So they want money to test you out, which was something I hadn't come across. But the, I guess the, that's affiliates. You asked about influencers. The most, um, the key thing, which I think a lot of people don't realize about influencer marketing is that now for a brand, the brands who are really into influencer marketing, who are running a lot of it, the creative that the influencer creates mm-hmm. is as important and as useful to them as the sales they bring in. So in pretty much every inf- advanced or, you know, or, uh, matured influencer strategy, it's about getting the influencer to create content that you then use in your own marketing as Mm -hmm. much as it is about getting them to create content that drives you traffic. So that content and the ability to reuse and repurpose the influencer's content is a really key part of of any influencer marketing strategy now. Mm -hmm. So that's something mm -hmm. which which I think a lot of people don't realize Mm -hmm. who are starting out. Yeah, I, I I know a few brands that they don't really care even if the influencer doesn't have an audience at all. As long as it creates the content, uh, there are very like creative creators on TikTok, let's say, that don't have a lot of, of subscribers or followers, and then they are probably going to be cheaper. But at the end of the day, if you sign a contract that they will give you a permission to use uh, their create their creation, creation as a creative in your own campaigns, 
So this also makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and it's it's a really you know brands are crying out for interesting, unique content, and that is um, it's a brilliant way to create it. Brilliant way <laughs> to create it. Mm-hmm. Do, do, do you find that there are any specific platform that are make make it make it easier to find these influencers, or just by scraping and reaching out and Google spreadsheets? <laughs> yeah, Google spreadsheets. Um, yeah, it's still it's still very much a a manual one. I haven't mm-hmm. found any particularly obvious tools to use to do it. Um, TikTok creators area is brilliant, and a lot mm-hmm. of people are using that to generate content to their news on Facebook. Obviously, let's go cross platform. the The thing I would say about that is, if you're going to go and do the big old trawl to find people, don't do it yourself pay someone on, yeah, on sure. via Upwork or Fiverr or something to do it. It's so outsourceable and will save you a whole chunk of time. Mm-hmm. Yes, I agree. Chloe, we already covered a lot of, of stuff and I'm sure that we can go on for hours and hours. <laughs> uh, is there anything uh, specific or like a question that I forgot to ask or anything that you found out lately or think that many people are overlooking that you would like to share before we, we conclude this episode? I think if, if everyone listening takes you know get your de- get your delivery and your post purchase more wow factor mm-hmm. work on building more partnerships in whatever shape or form into your business and think about that sustainability net zero part and how you can talk about that to your customers as well as make it part of your business i think if everyone takes that away we've mm-hmm. given them loads that's For going sure. to make them more successful this year for sure, for sure, and also they should uh, definitely analyze which part of the of the models they are overlooking with regards mm-hmm. to the different uh, steps and gaps. Uh, for sure, I agree. So, where can people contact you? Uh, you have two podcasts, so do you mind mentioning yeah. them? And of course, so the books we've mentioned, I said they're available on Amazon. The podcasts are e-commerce master plan, where I interview a different retailer or brand every week. Keep optimizing. We do, I interview a different marketing method every week and we focus on a different topic each month. And those you can find on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. And you can find all of that and how to get in contact with me at ecommercemasterplan.com. So ecommercemasterplan.com and you'll find all that good stuff. Awesome. Great. Yeah. And we will share, obviously, we will share the, the links in the show notes regardless. So it will be easier to find you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I'm uh, I'm already thinking about how, uh, the next invitation and next conversation. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Ron. It's been a pleasure hanging out with you and I hope this has helped your audience. Awesome. Bye-bye. Take care. Hi, guys. This is Yaron again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, if you want to learn more about e-commerce and marketing, make sure you check out our YouTube channel, which is called Ecom X Factor Official. Number two, check out our Facebook group, which is called Ecom X Factor Marketing and E-commerce Mastermind. This is a great place to ask questions and connect with other business owners. And last but not least, if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to share it with your friends and colleagues. Plus, leave a review at your favorite podcast app.